Yes, the finance minister has also explained government's policies and expenditure plans, he says, have been to invest and improve the lives of Ghanaians to access better opportunities and ensure that even as the government promotes business and expands the middle class, the enforcing philosophy will be driven by the preferential option for the poor. He touched on how the government has invested over 1.6 billion Ghana cities in employment under the NAPCO program. We therefore set out to invest significant resources in the lives of the Ghanaian people by increasing expenditures in education, agriculture, industry, and all of our human capital. Mr. Speaker, in acknowledging that education is the primary driver for upward social and economic mobility, we rolled out a raft of policy measures to improve the opportunities of our people. We invested $3.2 billion to implement free SHS, resulting in over 1.2 million teenagers being in secondary school now, looking forward to better opportunities in life, the Akufu Ado graduates. For their parents and families, this has translated into 2.2 billion in savings. That is money that the state has put back into the pockets of Ghanaians all across the country and investments for the state for their future. We have also invested in excess of 1.6 billion in 100,000 jobless but educated young adults who had been ignored by the state and were in despair. Through the new NAPCO initiative, they have been engaged in various state and private institutions with some of them securing permanent jobs in the process. That is money in the pockets of our youth. Mr. Speaker, from the onset, this government had determined that Ghana will be self-sufficient in food production through our planting for food and jobs program and would add value to what we produce as well. Create jobs along the value chain under the 1D1F program, which has currently over 70 factories in production, with many more under various stages of construction. So far, we've invested over 1.85 billion in our agriculture sector resulting in agriculture growth which averaged about 2% between 2014 and 2016 to an average of 5.2% over the past three years. That is putting food in abundance on the table of Ghanaians, reducing the cost of living, and putting money in the pocket of over 1.2 million farmers nationwide. And that was uh, Ken Oferiata, Finance Minister in Parliament. Now, Mr. Aveji, how does the minority intend to push for accountability from the Finance Minister, especially with the COVID-19 spending? Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, before I answer that question, um, let me talk briefly about the National Unemployment Insurance Scheme. Um, if you recall, recently, the former President Mahama made a call that in the situation of COVID, um, it's the SNEs should have come in and cushioned workers because you should not always be saying that SNEs is for after you have retired before you start benefiting. So I think that this is a response by this government to that suggestion made by President Mahama. But the issue about this national unemployment insurance scheme, we need to have clear understanding by the minister. What does he mean by that? Is it that workers who have been laid off as a result of COVID or latest workers who have been laid off in general that are going to be the beneficiary of this insurance? Or is it anybody who is not employed at all that is going to benefit? Because if we talk about employment in Ghana, the numbers are huge. And so we need understanding so that people will know clearly that they are the people who are going to benefit or they are not going to benefit. If we leave it this way, it means that everybody in Ghana who is not working will be looking up to that fund, where that insurance, which definitely I think that would be difficult for government to do. In that case, it is a private sector that might undertake that one, and it's going to be limited to only workers. So that is what I want to say about that. Now, the minister talked about this um, investment in people. I think all government in the past have all invested in people. That is why education has always remained the only sector that has taken a chunk of the budget of every government. In the previous government, education has taken more than 30% of the total budget of government. And so it remains the same. So if 
they say they're investing in people. Yes, that is a good good news, but it is something that is not new uh, by this government. But one thing that struck me when the minister said that the the graduates that are benefiting from these free SHS are now being called Akufuado graduates. It's, it's surprising. This is what some people have been saying that why is the money coming from the Akufuado's pockets or is the taxpayer's money? Those children who are benefiting from these free SHS, their parents pay taxes. So they are their parents' graduate, not Akufuado's graduate. That thing should be, should, be, should be stopped. We don't want that because the money is not personal money of the president. It is the people's of Ghana's money. And for that matter, calling these children Akufuado's graduate is something that I don't think is the best thing to do. But at no, least it was the uh, president Akufuado who initiated the free SHS. Initiated and paid by whose money? You and I. You pay tax, I pay tax. It's our money that is being used to take care of these children. So why do we call it uh, ICS graduates or average graduates? Simply because you happen to be the president at the time that this initiative is taking place. So I you will be debating this document do when? Next week? Please come again. You'll be debating the document when next yeah, week? Yeah, we'll, we'll, start, we'll, we'll start the debate on Monday, mm. next week. How do you intend yeah, to so push for uh, we, accountability? We, we, will, we will interrogate all the issues that are raised by the minister, as I'm saying here, for the minister to come clearly in most of those issues. They will f want to find out proper accountability, where, how the monies are being spent and where the monies are going to come from. If you're talking about a hundred billion um, uh, fund, uh, how you're going to raise those money, um, we need to find out so that clearly the people of Ghana will know that this budget is something that, because look, this government is a government that promised and never delivered. Mm. So yeah. this one should not remain one of the promises that will never be delivered. Well, let's listen to what the finance minister said about the impact of COVID-19 on Ghana's finances. We'll come back and wrap up the conversation. Mr. Speaker, just as the Ghanaian economy was beginning to consolidate its recent gains for growth and jobs, the COVID-19 outbreak hit the country, leading to the initial severe movement of, movement of restrictions. Although the restrictions are gradually being eased, the pandemic continues to pose significant challenges to the Ghanaian economy. The sectors heavily affected include the hotel and industry, foreign direct investment, trade and industry, agriculture, health, transportation, manufacturing, religious services, education, households and businesses have equally been hard hit with significant job losses and reduced incomes. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 has led to disruptions in corporate and general business confidence with threats to projected revenues, profitability, liquidity growth. So far, 19 of the 28 state-owned enterprises are projecting losses up to 1.6 billion for 20. Mr. Speaker, restrictions on movement and enforcement of social distancing protocols severely affected the transport sector. Commuter, minibus services, trotros, operated at 70% load capacity, whilst inner city buses had passengers reduced by 50% between March and May. We're likely being joined by the Deputy Finance Minister, Kweku Kwating, uh, via Zoom. Uh, many thanks for joining us on Joy News Prime. The minority says you're hiding behind COVID-19 to dupe the nation. Kindly unmute for me, Mr. Kweku Kwating. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And good evening to your viewers and uh, my colleagues. Uh, first, I would answer the question you asked, but it's important that uh, I correct an impression that was created earlier in the discussion about the resources from the IMF and the World Bank uh, not reflected in the budget. Uh, respectfully, that is completely false. And I would advise uh, that we go to page 108, you see Appendix 3A, Summary of Central Government Operations 2020. 
where you see the 20, um, 20 budget, you see the revised figures. Under program loans, under, under, <coughs> under borrowing, generally, you would see 22 uh, uh, billion uh, as what was programmed in, 20, in the 2020 budget. Uh, if you go to the revised budget, that increases to uh, 30 billion. That gives you about 8 billion. Now, the 8 billion would reflect the, the addition 8 billion is partly the 100 million preparedness uh, package from the World Bank and the one, 1 billion from the IMF. These are the only flows that have come, and they are clearly reflected in the financing tables of the budget. I, I can understand. I think uh, uh, some of these tables have not gotten to uh, some of these social com commentators yet, but my advice is that until you have gotten a copy of the budget, we should not be putting such statement out. It is pretty uh, unhelpful uh, to say that these have come to government somehow they were not reflected in the budget. And then second, uh, I have had suggestions that somehow we should have separated uh, government budget, traditional budget, from uh, COVID budget. Now, when you sit where we sit, you see that that is a very unhelpful proposition, and it is this. COVID has come to stay. COVID has come to stay. It is a new reality. And government must prepare its budget on the basis of these new realities. I do not know what we achieve by saying that if there was no COVID, this is what would have happened. There is COVID, and so this is what uh, we have. What would that achieve? Apart from perhaps uh, the political interest in saying that, uh, well, what, what, what we are presenting in respect of the COVID is either too small or too little. I don't know what we achieve by that. It is not the intention of government that perpetually we are going to be preparing some traditional budget that will follow the trajectory that we would have followed without COVID. But with COVID, this is uh, uh, the COVID budget. I, me, I don't know why you want me, to think along. Let me ask you a direct question. The minority says that the figures uh, that you brought earlier for approval now in the mid-year budget has doubled to over 11 billion. Um, how do you explain that? What has doubled to 11 billion? Your expenditure Which, for COVID-19. You see, when you say COVID-19, for instance, the agenda 111, where government is constructing um, hospitals uh, in the regions and in the districts. Is that a COVID-19 expenditure or not? You see, that is what we are confronted with when we want to go down this academic path of presenting a COVID budget and a non-COVID budget. There are very gray areas. Uh, I am, I, if anybody says the figures uh, have doubled. I want to see which specific figures they're referring to. We came to Parliament today to seek authorization for uh, uh, an additional expenditure of 11.9 uh, billion. Uh, we have explained clearly in the budget, if you get a copy of the budget, we have explained clearly where the expenditures are coming from. What we hope would be done is uh, a look at these figures and where people disagree with the content of the expenditures, let them provide alternative perspectives. We are happy to learn if people put across constructive criticisms. But to just uh, say the money is too much, and, and it just doesn't help in any way, but it is particularly unhelpful when we begin to make statements that, that, that are not true, mm. because uh, many of these things have been clearly explained in the budget. If we haven't read the budget yet, Please, let's take our time, read the budget, before we go around public commentary and say things that are not true. Mr. Avedji, let me pick your uh, quick reaction before we, 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 end, uh, we wrap up this conversation. Kindly unmute for me, Mr. Avedji. Mr. Avedji, kindly unmute for me. You're still mute. I hope I'm, I'm clear now. Can, yes, I can be heard yes, now. loud and clear. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, and um, welcome to the discussion. 
<laughs> basically, basically, the issue that uh, Aisha is talking about, about doubling of figures, is actually looking at what um, you came to Parliament to request um, when the uh, you were making a request to take money from the st uh, Stabilization Fund or from the Contingency Fund. The budget that you put out earlier on is what she is referring to as being doubled. But basically, basically, what you are asking for now as a supplementary budget is 11.9 billion, as you rightly quoted. And we also made reference to the same figure, that you are making additional expenditure of 11 billion. Our concern, our concern is that your revenue is dropping for over 20% from 68 billion to 53.7 billion. And yet your expenditure is increasing to uh, 97.7 um, billion, about 14% um, increase. The issue clearly is that, yes, we know COVID-19, it's something that we did not expect, but what effort are you making to ensure that you revamp the revenue? Okay, let, let, so let him that answer that, that question. That uh, let, let, him, let him answer as, that as question for me briefly. We're running out of time. We need to wrap up. Uh, uh, Mr. Kwatin, <laughs> just answer that direct question for me so we can wrap up. I agree. My brief response to him is this, that as a result of COVID, government revenue has suffered. But also as a result of COVID, government has come under some expenditure pressures. You want to uh, evacuate your nationals from outside. You want to provide relief. You want to do all those things that have been done so far to help us uh, as a country deal with this pandemic. What do we say? That because revenues are underperforming, we will not incur these expenditures. Of course we will. Mm. Now, if you look at globally, the, the global figures that the IMF have put out, as a result of this situation in almost every country, the deficit projected for 2020 globally, uh, or the average, is 13.9. So, Ghana uh, is doing poor. So the point I'm making is that this situation that your revenues are underperforming, so somehow don't spend on COVID, yes, it's not feasible. It is not happening no, in any country. No, nobody, okay. nobody says that. All right, that. so Go this back conversation back will be continued on PM Express. My point, my point Express. I'm raising is... Mr. Aveji, we're running out of time, but this conversation will certainly continue on PM Express with... George Riafe at 9 p.m. So stay on the Joy News channel. I'm grateful, gentlemen, that you joined us. Dr. Lord Mensa is economist with University of Ghana. James Kluzhaveji is Deputy Minority Leader. And Deputy Finance Minister Kweku Kwati also joined. I'm grateful for your time. Total.